Hey guys, Mac with MDC Diesel here. Today I wanted to go over boost leaks and how they can cause a turbocharger failure. So I've got in front of us our new 6.0 BGT turbocharger. This is our stage 1.5. This is a great upgrade for anybody that's looking for it. I'm gonna use this and my cutaway here as well as a wastegated housing to kind of describe and um, show you what's going on inside of a turbocharger to speed up the shaft, to slow down the shaft, um, and what a boost leak does and can do to a turbocharger as far as causing it to overspeed and fail. So I've got in front of us an S300 turbocharger that's been cut in half and the bearings installed in it. It's missing some clips in it because I can't get them to install with it cut in half like this. Um, but anyways, this is going to be used to demonstrate what's going on inside the turbocharger while it's running and what causes it to speed up and slow down and how it regulates pressure um, with or without a wastegate. This will also be used to show you how a turbocharger can overspeed in certain situations um, due to certain issues with the truck or um, due to overpowering it. So to show everything inside a turbocharger as far as bearings and what can possibly fail, um, we've got our two carrier bearings that essentially suspend the shaft. You can see I got a shaft right here. And those two bearings will hold the shaft still as the turbocharger is running. Um, it prevents it from moving up and down side to side. However, they do not prevent it from moving forward and back. So they'll be able to slide inside these bushings without anything holding it. That's where this bearing up front comes in play. That is a thrust bearing. As you can see, it's a washer essentially that slides into a bearing. It is clipped in via a C-clip up front. There's an oil seal and it pushes around the edges right here and then pins it to the actual center section itself. And so on the shaft, it'll prevent the shaft from moving forward and back. How these turbochargers work is there is oil pressure that come down, comes down through this oil port right here where the oil feed line comes in. It goes through the oil galley to the front to the thrust bearing. It also goes to these two rear bearings right here. And they go across, they put oil pressure into the bearings, and then that shaft essentially glides on oil. The thrust bearing pushes oil into this galley up top, which goes down into those ports, as you can see. And then they come out right here between the washer and the bearing. So essentially, as this is running, it should be floating on oil the entire time. So when you overspeed a turbocharger, what's happening is you're spinning the bearing so fast, spinning the shaft so fast, that oil, all that oil is ejecting from the washer and the bearing faster than it is being pushed into it. So you end up where this shaft spinning so fast that it ends up just rubbing metal to metal and at a very high RPM ends up wearing out the bearing. So what'll happen is the shaft will be able to move forward and back, which causes the wheel to contact the housings. The wheels sit very close into the housings. There's a very tight tolerance there. And if that shaft moves forward even a millimeter, it can contact the housing and cause a failure. So this is very crucial to not have fail. Typically in an overspeed situation, the rear two bearings are very rarely the failure point. Um, sometimes if the thrust bearing has let go and that shaft is moving forward and back, it can end up popping these out of their place and damaging them. Um, or if there's a loss of oil pressure, they'll get damaged, things like that. Or even if contamination goes back through the turbocharger because of the thrust bearing failure, the metal that it makes could go back through the turbocharger and cause um, issues. Not usually a big deal, but um, typically if there's a failure, it's going to be the thrust bearing is what fails whenever you overspeed a turbocharger. So to understand what drives the turbocharger shaft and speeds it up and slows it down, we need to understand the forces and how they're applied to the shaft to speed it up. A wheel, as you can see, is essentially little more than a device to leverage a shaft. So if you think of a steering wheel and a big old school bus, it's a little bit larger diameter than say in a small car because you need extra leverage to turn that big old shaft, that steering shaft to get those wheels to turn because the vehicle's heavier. Typically on older vehicles, the, without power steering, they may have a larger diameter steering wheel for that same reason, more leverage. Um, essentially, 
on a turbocharger, the fins can be add or seen as levers. As you can see here, there's just a bunch of little levers that turn a shaft as it goes around. The driving force that drives a turbine is exhaust pressure, also known as drive pressure. A compressor wheel is also a lever. So as this lever is turned, this lever is also turned. However, the blades are facing a different direction and pushing air the other direction. So I made a little model here to demonstrate using single levers. Instead of having multiple levers all the way around, we have just one lever and another lever to turn this shaft. So we'll call this the compressor wheel and we'll call this the turbine wheel and we'll call this the shaft that connects them in between. So as you can tell, obviously just representative of what the turbocharger is. As you apply a force to the lever on the exhaust side, the driving side with drive pressure, that force will rotate the shaft. And if you continue to apply that exact same amount of force to the shaft, it will continue to speed up until either the force is removed or until another force on the other end of the shaft opposes it and slows it down. So in a turbocharger, as you're applying the same amount of force, the shaft begins to speed up. However, when you have a compressor wheel on the other end, which is another lever, and you're rotating that shaft, if I can get this thing to turn, it turns the compressor wheel. And as that compressor wheel is turning, it is picking up air and scooping it and forcing it into the compressor housing and then out into the intake piping or intercooler piping and then into the engine. And as it's grabbing that air, it's creating resistance to the wheel turning. And as it builds boost pressure, as you know, once anything's under pressure, that pressure tends to fight back. And at some point, once the boost pressure equalizes to the force that is inputted on the backside, so the drive pressure, so once boost pressure equalizes to drive pressure, the shaft stops accelerating. It will maintain a constant speed. So in an ideal application, you'll have drive pressure build up, it'll speed the shaft up, and once the shaft builds enough speed and the compressor wheel starts to build boost, the boost pressure will start to increase and match the drive pressure in an ideal application, assuming everything is set up properly. Once drive pressure and boost pressure reach the same pressures, theoretically, the shaft should stabilize and maintain a constant speed based off of the input behind it and the output coming out of it. So I'm going to use my hands here as drive pressure and boost pressure. So as you can see, drive pressure is on the exhaust side, boost pressure is on the compressor side. So this is the exhaust pressure coming into it, drive pressure, and the boost pressure coming out of it, which is called boost pressure. So as you accelerate or rev up the engine, drive pressure is going to increase. That shaft is going to start speeding up and then boost pressure is going to start increasing. And then eventually they will equalize and the shaft will start to maintain whatever speed it stops at. And in a turbocharger that is sized properly, the shaft speed should stabilize before the threshold where the turbocharger may fail. So you don't want the shaft spinning so fast that the turbocharger is coming apart. You want it at whatever its maximum capabilities are and typically where the compressor is most efficient. Um, so it just depends on the horsepower setup, the size of the turbo and all of that. So all that's, you know, relevant to whatever setup you have. So let's say you have an ideally sized turbocharger for your application. It's not going to overspeed if everything's working properly. It's spinning at the correct rate, but then all of a sudden, you have a boot blow off or you have a pinhole leak in your intercooler boot or your intercooler busts or anything like that. You have a boost leak. So when a boost leak occurs, there is still forces being inputted into the drive side of the turbocharger, causing it to spin. However, as it is spinning, there will be less pressure 
due to the boost leak because some of the pressure is bleeding off to push against the compressor wheel to slow it down because the boost pressure opposes the forces being inputted. So if you have a boost leak, some of that excess pressure that would normally be used to equalize the speed of the turbocharger are no longer there. So now the turbocharger has to spin a little bit faster to make up for that lost boost due to a small leak. If you have a big leak, it has to spin faster and faster trying to catch up and eventually it will overspeed and typically fail before it reaches the speed that it, it needs to make up for that loss of pressure. So essentially overspeed is the primary cause of failure in a turbocharger. Um, typically as long as there's oil pressure to a turbocharger and there's no contamination going through that oil pressure and no contamination coming into the turbocharger, it's not very likely that a turbocharger will just fail on its own. Typically there's some outlying cause to it. Now over time turbochargers do wear out and will eventually fail because nothing will last forever of course. However, if you do have an issue where the turbocharger is failing and you can't explain why because you've replaced it with the right size turbocharger or even a factory turbocharger on a factory truck um, and you still have perpetuate the issue of a turbocharger failing, it may be due to a boost leak that is not seen. So pressure test your systems and make sure everything is good and in line uh, just to verify that nothing is going on externally causing the turbocharger to fail. So I hope y'all found this video helpful and maybe it was informational for some of y'all and taught y'all something new that you maybe didn't know. Um, if you like the video, like it, subscribe, follow along. I've got a lot more informational videos coming out in the future. Um, they're going to go very in depth into a lot of different setups and a lot of different applications and hopefully it'll help y'all understand the turbochargers through and through a bit better and maybe it'll help you choose a turbocharger that's right for your application.